to have these few minutes with you people. And I'm grateful for, to Brother Perry for this invitation of being here and for all your cooperation. I think this is our third visit to your fine city. We've always found the people here friendly, always speak, hand out, whether they know you or not. I visit some of the, the business places, and how nice, always seems different than it is up in the cold north. They see me come in, they wait on you and go out, and that's all of it. But you very seldom visit a place like somebody says, thank you, come back and see us again. I like that. And then I think that Brother Perry here, as I'd call him that, just I'm older than his father, so I guess I can call him uh, Brother Perry. We um, hardly knew the boy just on the introduction of my son, Billy Paul, who went to school with him. But if there's anybody in this city or around about within the reach of television that'll be lost at the last day, it won't be because that Brother Perry didn't put forth ever effort to try to get people to Christ. Amen. He certainly not left one rock uncovered. And I deem this a grand privilege of being here. When Brother Perry said to me, would I speak at a little banquet he was having at some of his business colleagues would be here. I'm, I'm certainly not a speaker. I, I don't claim to be that, but I thought I would, it'd be an honor for me, after having an invitation like that, to speak to the, the, his business colleagues. I have the privilege of traveling internationally around the world, and I speak much for the full gospel businessman's chapters. And I know this is just a little time of fellowship, so I'd like to express something that was cute one time. There was a man after I got through speaking, is all businessman. And so outside, there's a fellow come to me and he said, uh, You're a preacher, aren't you? I said, Yes, sir. He said, What are you hanging around these businessmen for? I said, I'm a businessman. So he said, uh, oh, you are? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm a businessman. So what kind of a business are you in, sir? And I said, uh, uh, eternal life assurance. <laughs> and uh, and um, he didn't get me just right. I said it fast. He said, uh, oh, uh, uh, the eternal life insurance. I never said insurance. I said assurance. And, but I never told him. And he said, uh, the Eternal life said, I don't know, I don't believe I've ever heard of it before. I said, that's too bad. He said, well, he said, uh, where's the headquarters? I said, heaven. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in that business. Hallelujah. I'd like to talk a policy over with any of you after the service is over tonight. I'm very enthused with my job and so... I never said not insurance. I said assurance. Uh, insurance is all right, understand. I remember, of course, I don't at this time have any. I remember after I was married, my wife and I was sitting in the house one day, and a good friend of mine, my brother's an insurance salesman, Western Southern. This boy was a salesman for the Prudential. I went to school with him. Very fine boy. His, his brother... Uh, writes the upper room for, I believe, the Baptist minister, and he writes articles in the little paper called The Upper Room. Very fine people. So he came up to see me one day, and he said, uh, he said, uh, Billy, uh, I hear that you got a little sting one time on insurance. And I said, yes. He said, it kind of gave you a little sour feeling towards him. I said, no, not exactly. He said, I thought I'd come and talk a policy with you, Billy. And I said, well, I said, Wilmer, thanks. I said, I, I got assurance. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. And my wife looked around at me as if I was a hypocrite. She knew I didn't have any. She looked at me just astounded. I said, oh, he said, I'm sorry, Billy. He must have thought I had it with my brother, Jesse. And I said, uh, 
My wife looked at me, and I said, yes, I have insurance. And he said, "Uh, what company? And I told him the same thing, the eternal life. And he said, oh, is that it? And I said, yeah, I have blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. He said, Billy, that's very nice. I appreciate that. But that won't put you up here in the graveyard. But I said, it'll get me out. I'm not worried. (laughs) I'm not worried about getting in. It's getting out. (laughs) I still like to talk a policy over with you after the service. I'm sure it's right. Now, I usually have the people to stand when we read the word, but... Tonight, I'll try to omit that because it's so, so hard for you to stand. But just before we um, read the Word, let's just bow our heads for a few moments as we speak to the author of the Word, as we've been kind of jesting with each other and kind of letting down our, as we call it, letting down our hair. So let's get on the sacred side now and the sincerity and Turn our hearts towards heaven as we open the Word. Now, any man that's able to move his hands can open the Bible, but there's no one really can open the understanding but the great Holy Spirit. So let us speak to him. Our Heavenly Father, we are certainly elated tonight to be assembled here with this group of people this side of eternity and to have this fine fellowship. And as we sit around these uh, tables tonight, looking across at each other, and business colleagues and, and Christians, we are aware that there's coming another time that we'll meet. We trust that we'll all be there, everybody present at that great wedding supper in the air, when the king will come out, wipe all tears from our eyes and say, "Is well done, my good and faithful servants. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. If there should be some, Lord, that doesn't know you in that way, and I pray tonight that something will be done or said that will cause them to change their way of thinking, turn to thee. Whether it's your present or by the, uh, the medium of television or by the tapes that will be going out from this. Bless us together now and bless the reading of thy word. Turn our hearts and thoughts towards the ending of this life and what will be our state at that time. For we are sure, Father, that all of us have to leave this world. We're mortals. And let us look to the Eternal One, the only one that can give us life beyond this. Through the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. I would like to call your attention for a few moments now to the reading of... God's Word. I'd like to begin reading from St. Mark's Gospel, I think the 10th chapter, and begin with the 17th verse. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came unto him one running and kneeling down and asking him, saying, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed since my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. And said unto him, One thing thou likest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasures in heaven. And come and take up thy cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. May the Lord add his blessings to the word as we endeavor to pull from this a text and context. Now, thinking on the subject of being with business people, and always 
I think that business people is always interested in, in good investments. So that I call a text now for the next few moments. The investments. A good businessman is always looking for a, a good, sound investment. If he isn't, then he isn't a good businessman. Amen. He must look for something that's real. And I'd like to talk to you on the invitation that I give to you a few moments ago on this eternal life policy. As I introduce myself as a, a businessman. And I have a business and I'd like to talk to you a few moments about it. And a few scriptures I have written down here and texts I'd like to use these for a few moments, these notes. It's not a, a good business to gamble. Any man knows that. That gambling is not a good business because it's taking a chance. You never or seldom see a gambler. One day he's a rich man, the next day he's begging. So you take too much of a chance to, to gamble. I think a, a, a gambler is, is just simply living on the spare of the moment and not looking forward to the future, or you wouldn't be gambling. And I do not believe in some of these uh, get-rich-overnight investments either by some unidentified business. Now, any good businessman wouldn't take a chance like that, maybe on your, your life's savings, your earnings, and you would uh, invest it in some uh, get-rich-right-quick, get it's unidentified, someone running with some kind of an idea, here we are. Uh, we got a certain firm here. There's no background to it. I think a good, sound-thinking man would be foolish to try to make an investment in such a, a company as that. Because I had a friend one time that, that tried such a thing, and when he did, he, he lost everything he had. And he lost all of his life's earnings, about ready to retire. And he thought, well, I'll, I'll take this chance because the man seemed to be he knew what he was talking about. But come to find out, uh, the company was just a make-believe company and no stocks or nothing. So the, the poor fellow lost everything he had. So I think if a man wants to make a good investment, he should first check his company or whatever he's making an investment in to find out what he's going to do. I think any sensible thinking person would do that. And then again... Before I go on, I'd like to say it's not a good idea to keep your money in your pocket. Many people say, I I'll just put it in my pocket and I, I, I got it. But, you know, you businessmen and women, you don't think in those terms. And it's not a good thing because it can be stolen. It's best to have it in circulation. Like the Lord said one time, he gives so many talents to so many and such. And then he, they made an investment with it. And those who made a good sound investment... He uh, give them the dividends. But when uh, one man said, I, di I just kept it. I, I didn't want to take any chances on it. I, I, I put it in my pocket or I buried it somewhere. Then he'd taken that, what he gave to him, and give it to the one that had uh, drawed more dividends. It put it to a good investment. And that's our Lord's way of doing things. Now, but... Uh, if you were going to invest in something that you wanted to be sure in, you'd find some good, reliable firm that has uh, been proven that it'll pay off right. Now, that's a good, sound in investment. If you've tested the firm, you know its backgrounds. Talk with somebody who's done business with this firm. and Hear the testimony of everyone. It's 100 percent. They're always right on the dot with their dividends. They, and there's a great uh, resource capital behind it. The company's not going broke. And that's a good, sound investment. And now all through life, people's been uh, taught that. Now we're speaking tonight on the scripture of a young Hebrew boy that was a, a wealthy type of a lad. He might have come from a real good home, no doubt. His testimony showed that he come from a, a good home. He was called in the Bible the rich young ruler. 
I'm going to change it tonight just a little bit and say a rich young businessman because he had a business and he was interested in, in business. No doubt his father had been a great successful businessman or he probably wouldn't have had what he had. But he was uh, brought up to, to be a businessman. And he seen something in this young fellow of Galilee, this young prophet by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. No doubt he'd heard his priests speak about him and maybe against him. But when he got his first glimpse at the Lord Jesus, there was something about him that was different from any other man. And I say this as a Christian, it is truly, it hasn't changed. We have great theologians in the land throughout the world, we've had them for thousands of years, that uh, can introduce to us a, a creed, and they're schooled in those creeds, and a church that's, that's a well-established church. But uh, that still isn't my, uh, my policy tonight I'm speaking of. I'm talking about eternal life. And this uh, young fella, knowing that he was a member of the church, but seeing in Jesus something different. So he was uh, giving the opportunity to make an investment when he found Jesus and seen what he was doing and had read his Bible and seen in Jesus that the thing that he's heard his prophets read in the, his church and what they were. And he no doubt studied that. And then when he saw in this Jesus of Nazareth, which was supposedly to be among the people, the prophet, he saw something in this man that identified him with the scriptures. And I think today it hasn't changed too much. Bible readers and Bible lovers, when we really get a glimpse in our intellectuals of what Jesus was and what he is, it changes our entire attitude. There's no one like him. No matter how fine we said, we understand that he, we suppose he had no much schooling and he talked like a common man and dressed like a common man and lived with common man, but yet there was something outstanding about this man. And it attracted the attention of this young fella in so much that he had all the wealth of the world perhaps that he needed and would use in his lifetime. And he was well satisfied with that. But he seen that this man looked into the future and told him the things that were coming and identified himself in the Scripture and God identified himself in the man. Now, there's not a man that lives that's in his right mind, but what's always wondering where he come from, who is he, and where is he going? There's been many books written, philosophers, as raised and fell. But there's only one book that'll tell you who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. That's the Bible. That's the only book. Of all the fine books we have, you could trash them every one. This is the truth. Anything contrary to this is not right. Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never fail. Every man's word shall be a lie. God shall be true. And when you see something so definitely before you, and the Scriptures promise for that day what that Messiah was to be, and this young man seen that identified by God, then that made Jesus altogether different from any other man he had ever seen. So he was given the opportunity when he found the Lord Jesus and perhaps seen him in his meetings and his service, he run to him and fell down at his feet showing his attitude of approach was correctly. And he said, Good Master, uh, what could I do to have eternal life? Now, that's the thing that's in question. Not his money, 
Or not could I join your church, sir? Or could I belong to your organization? But what must I do to have eternal life? That was the question. And he was given the opportunity to receive it. But he made a rational decision. He was turned it down. He wasn't interested when he found out what went with it. He realized that in order to do this, he had to give up his popularity because Jesus was unpopular, unbelieved among, uh, I would rashly say, 90% of the people, or maybe 95%. Was, he was disbelieved as some uh, evil-spirited person. And was called by many Beelzebub, a devil. And yet the scriptures perfectly identifying him, he had referred back to them saying, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, or tell who I am. This Hebrew lad, being raised up in a home and knowing that the Bible had had clearly told them, the scrolls, God, Jehovah, had said that if there raise up one among you who is spiritual or prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in visions. And if what he says comes to pass, then hear that prophet, for I'm with him. But if it doesn't come to pass, then do not hear it. That's plain to, uh, language. It's only sound thinking if he's said it and it doesn't happen, then it's a lie. God did not say it. But if he says and it, it does happen, that's truth. And nothing's more and more truer than truth. So this young man had seen this in the Lord Jesus and know that he held the keys to this eternal life. And he wanted this eternal life. But he turned down the opportunity to make his investment. He wasn't interested in such an investment. Although the, the, he was well identified that he was the Son of God, is perfectly identified the virgin had conceived, brought forth the Son. He had done every sign that Messiah was supposed to do. But in order to accept him, he had to get away from his tradition. He had to turn away from it. We would like to contribute that only to the, this Jewish boy, but it's too bad we have to also notice it today the same way. It's a great price. We can contribute to the churches of the day. And many times people who call themselves believers and are unwilling to separate themselves and to depart from the things of the world as this young ruler was asked to do to have the policy of eternal life. Yet after we too see it well identified by the Scripture, that the policies are still being given to whosoever wants to receive it. As I said, he saw something in Jesus, no man had, but the price was so great that he didn't want to pay the price. It's the same thing today, as I believe tonight I might be speaking to different denominations, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Orthodox Jew, Buddha, whatever more. That's the business people of the cities. But there's really, when you see something with your own eyes that the Scriptures identify to be the truth, we would be most unreasonable people that if we're interested in eternal life, to turn it down. It would be a, a rational decision like this young man made. Many times even our clergy today makes this same rational mistake. Though polished scholars in creeds, that know it A to Z. But remember, those priests in that day know the scrolls from A to Z too. But they failed to see what this young man saw. And he was interested in, in Jesus uh, giving him eternal life. But when he found out what it was going to cost him, then he wasn't interested. You know, the Bible tells us in this age that we're living as our most gracious brother Perry here has expounded to us that he believed that it was in 
the last days. I certainly firmly believe that with all my heart. I believe the Scripture identifies it. I believe that uh, it's science that uh, identifies it. Scientists says that it's three minutes till midnight. The, the, there are programs that we see on television and, and on radio and, and uh, how our people are acting. It's, as I made a remark uh, here or somewhere else, that it reminds me of all the carrying on that they do. It reminds me of a little boy going through a graveyard at nighttime whistling, trying to make himself think he's not afraid, but he is. That's what's the matter with all of our turning to all we're doing today, all our popular carrying on. We are trying to make people think that we don't know that the hour is at hand. Amen. But we know it is. Our scientists know it. Our, the Pentagon knows all. We all know that there's something fixing to happen. You, you can feel it right in the atmosphere. And we know it's at hand. And our Bible tells us in Revelation, the third chapter, that the church in this age is going to be identified just like this Rich, young Hebrew boy. Rich. Have need enough of this lady. I'll see an age if there happens to be ministers here or Bible readers. This is the lady. I'll see an age. And it said, because I am rich, said as a queen, have need of nothing. Said, nor sound not that you are wretched, poor, blind, miserable, naked, and don't know it. The sad thing of this scriptural quotation is, if we seen a man or a person on the street that was blind and naked and miserable and poor, that would be a, a horrible sight. There's no one but what would run to them as quick as they could and say, friend, you're naked, uh, you must, you must, you're exposed. Come in quickly and, and, and let me give you some clothing and I'll take you to somewhere to see if I can uh, get a physician and restore your sight or try to do something for the person. What if you met such a person as that? And they would turn around to you and tell you to attend to your own business. They don't even know they're in that condition. Now, if you're that way and know it, it's not too bad. But when you're that way and don't know it, that's the bad part. You can't tell them. And this scripture must be fulfilled as all scriptures must be fulfilled. The Bible said that this would be the estate in the last days. And they turned down Jesus and he was on the outside of the church trying to get in. Amen. Turned it down just as plain as this young Hebrew did. And this was a Gentile church. The bride church called out called the Christian church in the last days. But they put him out for the same reason that this young Hebrew businessman turned him out. The price was too great. They couldn't receive it. The Bible said here that they were rich. Said they had need of nothing. This young boy was rich, had need of nothing. We're fine denomination. He's got great orders built. We've got the brotherhood. We've got all this, that, or the other. We've had our creeds for the hundreds of years. We set, we have need of nothing. Don't tell us anything about it. Uh, that's more of an arrogant uh, attitude than this young fellow took. He didn't take that type of an attitude. The Bible said that Jesus looked upon him and loved him. I wonder today if in the midst of all of our confusion and our worldliness, and yet trying to hold our Christian profession, if it isn't the love of God that constrains the ministry to stay on the field. Amen. I wonder if it isn't the same thing as here we find him knocking at the door, trying to get in. Now we find these things. They, all through the ages it's been this way. Now to save time talking of the policy again, and just temporarily outlining it for you. Now, this rich boy, he didn't ask to join his church. He, he belonged to church. It proved it. Jesus said to him, keep the commandments. Thou knowest them. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie, defraud, or, 
and do and then honor your father and mother. And this young fellow proved that he was a a fine cultured boy, not a just a somewhat we call today a, a hoodlum. He was a fine type of boy, been raised up in a good home. He said, Master, I've done these since I was a boy. All my life. See, he showed that his parents was nice parents. He is, went to a church that believed in keeping the commandments. But yet in the church, keeping the commandments, still didn't answer what he saw in Jesus. He know with our creed and with our church and keeping the commandments, still doesn't give us eternal life. Amen. It did not then, neither does it do it today. There's something you've got to do. Now, we find that it wasn't because that he wasn't a church member. It wasn't because he wasn't morally right. He was. But we can be a church member and morally right. Still not obtain eternal life. Not to know the Word. Some of them are theologians and scholars and Sunday school teachers, Bible expositors. But that doesn't mean anything. Satan knows that Bible better than any of us. The Bible said to know Him is life. Not know the Word. Know Him is life. Satan also believes and trembles. But we've got to have an experience of a death, burial, and resurrection from our old life to the new life which comes in Christ that comes only by the Holy Spirit. Amen. The new life. Now, let us investigate some of these people down through the ages that's helped this policy and see whether it pays off or not. Now, I'd just like to bring you, as I told you in the beginning, that you should consult somebody when you go to make an investment. Find out what happens. What Does it pay off right? You should do that in your business. I want to speak of some of the holders of this policy. I'd bring to your attention tonight, back in Genesis, to a, a prophet by the name of Noah. Though he was tried in every way he could, to, every way Satan could try him, to make him give up that policy. But Noah helped the promise of God, the policy of life. Because God told him that everything outside of that ark would be destroyed. And though it seemed kind of unusual to the modern thinking people of his day, that's what makes the gospel today it's the unusualness because God is unusual. His word is interpreted unusual to what we sometimes have it interpreted. But as I've said before, God needs nobody to interpret his word. He does his own interpretation by, by bringing to pass the things that he said he would do. He interprets his own word. He doesn't need our interpretation. It's, you know, our interpretation is our own man-made thoughts that we put with it. When God said, let there be light and there was light, that needs no interpretation. God said, a virgin shall conceive, and she did. That doesn't mean any interpretation. Jesus said, the Son of Man goes up to Jerusalem and be given into the hands of sinful man. They'll crucify him, and on the third day he'll raise up again. That needs no interpretation. He said, a little while, and the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me. For I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the age, to the consummation. He's here. Amen. It doesn't need any interpretation. Hallelujah. It's his promise. The works that I do shall he do also. He that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do also. That's found in St. John 14, 12. And we know that that's true. So it doesn't need any interpretation. Noah, with the word of God, held on to it because he was a policyholder of life insurance. Life assurance. He helped the policy. And he was an agent for the policy. And he went forth everywhere, but because it was unpopular, he couldn't get anybody to take a hold of it. Just his own family. He was, his, his policy seemed to be all out of date for the people. It seemed to be against the scientific reasoning of the day. Rains coming down from heaven. 
It had never rained upon the earth, you remember. The world stood up straight. We can prove that today. That it once stood that way. And God watered vegetation through irrigation from springs in the earth. Now, science in that day were probably much smarter than they are now because they built the Sphinx and the pyramids and, and so forth, things that we couldn't attempt to do today. We had no powers that could, could do it. But they built it. And I suppose maybe they shot the moon with radar or whatever they had in that day. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, another civilization likened it to that. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You see here recently where they dug up a modern waterworks here in old Mexico. Have no history of it at all. It might have been from some other age gone by. Jesus said, as it was in that day, smart man, intelligent. But if it was, then there will be a life policy Amen. offered to the people. He said so. And Noah, he might not be able to explain his sign, said we can uh, take the instruments and prove there's no rain up there. Sir, you are out of your mind. But still he knew the voice that spoke to him was God. So if God had said there was water coming from up there, though there was no water, God is Elohim, the self-existing one. He's the all-sufficient one. If he said there can be water up there, he's able to put water up there to keep his word. A father Abraham, which is the father of many nations. If there happened to be Jewish people sitting there, wonder how the Gentiles was brought in. Abraham was a father of many nations. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He held a policy also. God had made him a promise to be father of many nations. Not only the Hebrew nations, but other nations. And he'd be father of. Notice, as he did, the promise God gave him was rational. Radical. He was 75 years old and Sarah was 65 before he got the promise. But he separated himself from the unbelievers because he knew he was an heir of righteousness by the will of God. And no matter how long it taken, perhaps the first month passed by and he said to Sarah, how do you feel? There's no difference. He said, we'll have the baby anyhow. God said so. Go ahead and make the booties. Get everything ready. God said we'd have it. That settles it. Hallelujah. The first year passed. Dear, how do you feeling? No different. Well, it's going to be a greater miracle than it was if it happened the first month. See, she was about ten years past menopause when the promise was given. They had no children. She was barren and he was sterile. So they, but he still helped that policy. Because it was the word of God, a promise. Amen. He wasn't going to depart with it. And the Bible said that Abraham staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God, knowing this, that he's able to do that which he's promised to do. Amen. So the child was born because that he helped the, the policy. Noah held his policy and it saved his life. That was a payoff. Amen. Not only his life, but his family's life. Paid off with saving him. Let's talk to another investor in this eternal life insurance. Daniel, the prophet, when as we would call it, if you excuse it as a world expression, I shouldn't make it a sports here at the pulpit. It's the only way that I know to make it when the chips are down. King Nebuchadnezzar had come in and taken the children of Israel because they had went away from God. They had still doing all their sacrifices. When God asked them to offer lambs and bullocks and so forth, a man, a fine Jew, walked down the road with a fatted bullock or a, or, or a little lamb under his arm on the day of the atonement, went down to offer it for his sin. He was sincere when he killed that lamb and the priest stabbed it and he held his hands upon it, knowing that life was taken to save his life. He was sincere in it. And as long as he was sincere, it was all right. But the time come when it become a family tradition. 
Then God said, He sent a prophet on the scene by the name of Isaiah. He said, Your sacrifices, solemn feasts stink in my nose. That's where we people have got. We join church, which is all right. We do those things. But you say, are you a Christian? I'm Methodist. I'm Baptist. I'm Presbyterian, Pentecostal, or something else. It's a tradition. There's no entering its sincerity anymore. They won't move up. Cope up with the scriptures and things. They just live any way they want to. If they got a pastor tries to correct them, they out him. They have nothing to do with him. And they can't bring Hollywood in the church. Parties, bunco parties, soup suppers and everything else. Let the women act any way they want to. Dress any way they want to. Immorally anything. Sex appeal becomes a, a modern trend. It's a disgrace. Amen. Jesus said to that woman, you may be as virtuous as you can be, but you answer for adultery at the day of judgment. You're wearing those clothes. Jesus said, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And no matter how innocent you are, that sinner will answer for adultery and you're the one presented it. You Christians, aren't you ashamed? You should act like daughters of God. And you men, members of the church, deacons, even the ministers, that will permit your wives to do that. You should be sons of God. Amen. That don't sound like the behavior of a son of God with the nature of his father in him. Amen. Afraid to say something that cause the organization would turn you out. That's right. Amen. Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile his investment. Amen. He purposed, no matter what the world how. Rich the king gets and how much he tries to get me off into things of the world. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to defile my investment. Oh, Christian world. Don't defile your investment that you've made in eternal life. You'll pollute it. Daniel purposed that he wouldn't do it. It paid off by saving his life when he was thrown into a lion's den. His investment really paid off. The Hebrew children were determined that they'd not worship an idol. And it paid off by saving their life in a fiery furnace. Then comes Simon Peter, a fine Pharisee who had been taught by his father that the day would come, that, that there'd come the Messiah all through the ages that Jewish people had looked for. It. And no doubt that his father told him, Son, I... I Read a little story one time about it. Might have been fiction. I don't say it was authentic. But he said that I've looked for the time of the coming Messiah. And said, I, I, I know that before that time comes, there'll be all kinds of isms, false things going on. But son, as a Hebrew, we're taught as Hebrews to believe our prophets. For the word of the Lord comes to the prophets and him only. The Lord said, I do nothing except I reveal it to my prophets first. And this Messiah, according to Moses, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet among you of your brethren, liken unto me. And the Messiah will not be an educator. He will not be a denomination. He will be a prophet, and the word of the Lord will be with him. Andrew had heard John speak of such a one coming, the baptizer. But then one day... Simon himself walked up into the presence of this Jesus of Nazareth. And as soon as he looked up on him, he said, Your name is Simon, and you are the son of Jonas. Amen. He took out a policy right quick. Amen. He knew that was the Messiah. Amen. That was the vindicated scripture of his day. The Messiah. How did the others fail to see it? There was one standing name of Philip who went about 15 miles around the mountain to a fellow named Nathaniel that had Bible studies together. Maybe their conversation was something like this. As he found him under a tree praying, he said, Nathaniel, of course, being a gentleman that followed Jesus, any man that follows Jesus will be a gentleman. Amen. So he found him praying. He, he waited a while. But you notice he never talked to him about his olive groves or so forth. He went straight to the mark. Come see who we found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
He said, now, could there be anything good come out of Nazareth? He said, come see. Amen. That's the best answer any man could give another. Amen. Come find out for yourself. Don't sit home and criticize. Amen. Come investigate it yourself. On the road around their conversation, might have been like this. Maybe Nathaniel said, you know, we've been looking for a Messiah for years. You know, Philip, how we've studied this. Well, I believe that the Messiah come, God will pull the quarters in heaven and let the great quarters come down the stairway right on our, the great temple yard where uh, the Caiaphas is, our high priest is, and you'll say, I'm here. <laughs> but that's not the way the Scripture said he would come. Amen. He'll only come the way the Scripture said he has come in a prophet, just like Moses was, an ordinary man, a sheep herder. Notice, and when he come up into the presence of of the Messiah, and he was in the line, or praying for the sick, or whatever he was doing. We find that the Messiah looks over at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. Now, you might think it was because he was dressed that way, but remember, all the Eastern people dressed alike, turban and beard, so forth. Remember, Jesus walked with them to, on the road to Emmaus all day long. After his resurrection, they didn't even know him. Dressed the same way. So we find that in this great presence of him, he said, Rabbi, this fine young Hebrew, said, Rabbi, when did you know me? When did you ever know me? Know me to be a, an Israelite and honest, uh, the reputation that I have. You've never seen me before. How did you know me? And he said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. Oh, amen. He took out a policy. Amen. Fell at his feet like this other young fellow did. He said, Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. His name's immortal today. There's a little woman, I might speak of her because of the ladies standing near. This little lady wasn't like you. She had a, a moral charge against her with the church. Maybe some young kid had been turned out on the street wrong. Maybe her parents hadn't taken care of her. She was a half Jew and Gentile. She is a Samaritan. Remember, there's only three races of people. If our scripture's right, God forgive me for even mentioning if it's right. It is right. It's God Himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The same yesterday, today, and forever. So this young lady being turned out. First, I might explain Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. Now, we, the Gentile, we were heathens in them days. We were worshiping idols, but the Jew and Gentile were looking for a Messiah, and he only comes to those who are looking for him. Sometimes today we say we're looking for him and put millions and billions of dollars and things and building institutions and things. I wonder, and missionaries starving on the field, I know them out there tonight preaching without a pair of shoes on. Yes. Amen. We put millions and millions of dollars to nonsense. And then... Why our own acts condemn our testimony. But here, this young woman, as we know her, she is a Samaritan. Jesus is on his road to Jericho, which is below Jerusalem. And he went around uh, to Samaria and came to a city called Sychar and sent the disciples in to buy victuals, foods. While they were gone, this young woman came up to get water and he he said to her, bring me a drink. And she looked around and see him being a Jew. She said, it's not customary that you would uh, ask uh, me that. said, you're a Jew. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. I'll give you water. You don't come here to draw. So the conversation went on about religion. Finally, he contacted her life. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. said, you've told the truth. You've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Now, a few days before there, the teachers and rabbis of that day, the man that ought to have known better, said he's Beelzebub. He does that by an evil spirit. They had to answer their congregation. Amen. So they made up, said, it's an evil spirit. And Jesus said, I'll forgive you for that. The atonement hadn't been made. But when the Holy Ghost has come to do the same thing, to speak against it, will never be forgiven. Amen. And we know what happened when Titus... After they had rejected the Holy Spirit, Titus burnt the temple and scattered the Jews to all over the world. And they're just now gathering again. It's fulfilling Scripture. Now notice. Now this young woman, when 
Those Jews seen that done and called it an evil spirit, an unclean spirit. The Bible said, calling the spirit of God doing the work an unclean spirit, a devil, like a fortune teller or some evil person. And then, quickly, this woman, no different. When he said, go get your husband, she said, I have none. He said, you said truth because you have five, and the one you're living with, not your husband. Look at this. Quickly. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Amen. Remember, they had no prophets for nearly 500 years. Amen. Malachi was the last Hebrew prophet. We, we know that Messiah is coming. And this will be the identification of Messiah. Amen. We know when he comes, this is what he'll do. Jesus said, I am he that speaks with you. And she took a policy. Amen. <laughs> And into the city she went to scatter the good news that she had found the Messiah. She had eternal life because she believed on him. How did she know? She seen the identification of the scripture manifested by him. We know that when a Messiah comes in, 400 years we haven't had a prophet. And when he comes, that will be the next man on the scene. And when he comes, we'll know him. And he used to do that same thing. That I'm he. Amen. She took a policy. She's interested in it. Nicodemus. A few moments in closing now. Nicodemus, a rabbi, man of about 80 years old. He had been convinced that there was something about Jesus that was different than other men. So he wanted a policy. So he came by night for the policy. And he found the bank open. For business. <laughs> it's always open. It's open at a banquet. It's open out there on the street. It's open anywhere where there's anybody ready to do business. This policy, and the one who holds it, he found the banks open. He took a policy. Now, we know in Luke 24, 49, after Jesus had chose his disciples... They were holders of the eternal life policy. So now, you know, in a regular insurance policy, they always pay dividends. So they had already been accepted and chosen by Jesus. So they went up to Jerusalem waiting till the day of Pentecost to get their dividends. And it paid off with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and power to manifest Jesus Christ. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Orthodox, whoever you are, that claim to be Christians, why don't you do the same? You believe on Jesus Christ and become a member of the church, why don't you go up to Pentecost, get your dividends, the power of the Holy Spirit. Then policyholders draw it, you can too, if you believe it and really believe it. Peter, speaking to them, said, the promises unto you and your children. To them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. They want to know what to do. He said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It was a promise. So if you're just a confessor tonight and have never drawn your dividends, why don't you bring your policy tonight? Let me talk it with you a little while. Kneel with me for a few minutes and find out if it isn't so. Be sincere about it. It'll pay off right now. If you're really holding a policy, you'll recognize a policy, your faith, if you say it's in God, if it's in God and in His Word and not in some church or denomination or creed, but just believe in Jesus Christ, it'll pay off. Amen. He knows His own policy. Bring another character in just for a few moments. There was another rich Hebrew that met Jesus one day after his death, burial, and resurrection. If there should be a Hebrew here tonight, or whoever you are, him being crucified is not any excuse for what you can meet him right here, just the same as, as a rich young ruler met him. If you want a policy, he's sure to do business. There was a man by the name of Saul, and he was taught in all the great teachings and traditions of his people. Gramalia was his teacher, one of the finest Hebrew teachers of the time. And Saul was so zealous of this until he stoned Stephen's or witnesses Stephen, or sanctioned it, helped the coats of those while he sanctioned having authority from the high priest to throw all on people of that 
policy in jail because they've been told by his elders that this man was no prophet. There was nothing to this man but a radic. He had letters in his pockets going down because he heard there was some down at Damascus holding that policy. And they drawed interest on it. And they were really doing things. And the high priest told him, Saul, you're a zealous man. Take this authority from me. Go down there and rest every one of them because they're nothing but radics. They're nothing to them. Go down and bind them and throw them in jail. You have to kill them, kill them, it's all right. Go get them. Saul said, Your Honor, Sir, Holy Father, I'll go. Down he went. On his road down, he's going about 11 o'clock today, nearing the city. All of a sudden, out of the heavens, come the pillar of fire. Amen. Struck him down. And he raised up to look. There was that pillar of fire before him. Now, to prove that to you, he was a Hebrew. And he would have never worshipped anything or called anything Lord, lest he know it was Lord. And he knew as a teacher under Gamaliel that the angel of the Lord, which was the Logos that went out of God, which was Christ, that led them through the wilderness was in the form of a light, a pillar of fire. And when it struck him down and he looked up and seen it there, he said, Lord, he would have never called nothing but that Lord. But being a Hebrew, he knew that that was Jehovah. Amen. That's the reason he had the revelation, could say that Jesus of the New Testament was Jehovah of the Old. Amen. That was his revelation. Because he had seen Jehovah. And he said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. And it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he took out a policy. Compare the two men together. One rich young Hebrew that wanted to hold to the traditions. Another one that was convinced. One of them seen him as a man. That God was made flesh in order to die, to take away the sin. The blood of lambs and things, the life is in there, couldn't come on the believer. Because it's a lamb's life, it has no soul in it, an animal life. But this was God himself. And then we become born of that spirit. We're sons and daughters of God. The life that was on our sacrifice. Compare the two men together. Seen it vindicated that God was in Christ. The same pillar of fire that had brought his people through the wilderness and brought them to there. Nourished them all the day. Remember when Jesus was on earth, he said, I come from God. And I go to God. He was the pillar of fire that took the children through the wilderness. The Bible said that Moses esteemed the riches of Christ greater treasures than that of Egypt. He forsook Egypt to follow Christ. When he was sure that pillar of fire was represented in him. God, he said, if I do not the works of my father, then believe me not. The works tell you what I'm supposed to do. If I don't do that, then don't believe it. But if you can't believe me, they said, you're, you're a man making yourself God. said, if you can't believe me as a man, believe the works. They testify. Amen. Now, when he was dead, buried, rose, ascended, here we find him again in that pillar of fire. He come from God and went to God. He's still the same one. Amen. Same one now. Notice, sure, same one that he was. And when Paul, or Saul then, recognized that God, Jehovah, the pillar of fire of the Old Testament had called himself Jesus. He took out his policy. <laughs> he was ready for it then. What a rational decision for that young ruler. What a... How he must have... Well, how could he do it? What would you give in exchange for your soul? After all your buildings, you, you leave it for your relatives to fight over and everything, what about that soul and where are you going to be? Remember, you'll be somewhere thousands of years from tonight. This might be the time for you to make your decision. Notice 
What a rational mistake this is. What a, what a poor businessman he was. To try to hold to a tradition when it had been proven to him and vindicated that here was eternal life and he witnessed the same by asking Jesus about it. Paul accepted it. We know how he come out. Like the people of the day, they like the proper opinion, man's praise instead of the honor of God. Paul didn't care for the praise of man. He wanted the honor of God. Let's follow this young boy just a moment before we close. Let's follow him. We find the next place that this young fellow, you know what happened to him? He never become a pauper for doing this. He never become a beggar on the street. He increased in goods. He had turned down the opportunity. Many times, people today laugh and make fun of the Holy Spirit. They go on and increase in their business. You know, excuse this expression. But when they're laughing, say, why, well, look at me. If there's anything to it, see what it happened to me. Something that happened to me. You know, there's a, a, a proverb that fools will walk with hobnailed shoes where angels fear to trod. This young ruler practically did that. See? He made a, a horrible mistake. And we find out that it never hindered his business. He increased. He got more popular. Got more goods. We find out after a while that he got so great that even he had to build new barns to put his stuff in. And because that the church has turned down the Holy Spirit... In this last days, it's increased. Amen. And now you're going into the ecumenical council. Just exactly what the Bible said you would do. Now you're really a Laodicea, rich and increased in goods. Just exactly like that young man was. He was a type of the church, rejecting. Paul was a type of the one receiving. Both of them had the opportunity, as you have tonight, and I have. He increased in good. So as the church, the lady of C and AIDS increased in good. And remember, he got so great, he become so pauper, till even the monarchs, the great people begin to come, and he set a great banquet one time. And there was a holder of the eternal life policy at his bazaar. And we find out that he's laying down at the door. Oh, he might sweep some crumbs off to him. He had the opportunity again. A witness. Lazarus testifying to him. But he just swept the crumbs off. Oh, well, I'll try this, take this quarter, or whatever, you know. That's about the attitude of 1964. Oh, I'll help a little. That's all right. Just let him go. See. But he held the policy. The poor in spirit, Matthew 5, tells us that's the one. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He went on increasing in goods and getting greater and more popular and a great man. But his payoff finally come. It finally come. On earth, he had a great payoff. He had a great funeral service, no doubt. The great denominational preacher come, probably spoke great words over him, might have half masked the flag. Fine businessman packed him to his barrel. But the Bible said in hell. His pay it off come for rejecting the eternal life policy. Amen. In hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he looked off across the great chasm that Jesus said, No man has ever crossed or ever will. And he found the policy holder of eternal life comforted on the other side. Both of them, one had received it, both had their payoff. The crumb sweeper had the payoff. And now the rich man becomes a beggar. Let the policyholder come back and touch my lips with the, a little water, or these flames are tormenting me. Don't make the same mistake, businessman. You're a mortal just like they were. You've got to make a decision. Make your investment now. Make it sure. Make your election call and sure. Take out one of the policies. Look. It's just a moment or two more, if you can. When Moses, who forsook being a king of Egypt, a Pharaoh, Amen. esteeming the reproach of Christ, Pharaoh looked out upon them people as a bunch of mud daubers. 
But Moses looked upon them as the people with a promise. Amen. How do you look on them? God's people. Amen. Moses had his payoff. Watch his pallbearers. The Bible said they were angels. Why? Nobody else could take him where he was going. <laughs> they were his pallbearers. That was Elijah in the time that all the women cut their hair like Miss Kennedy and them does today. Painted their faces, the Jezebel, a king and all. The people went whirly. The church did too. And God sent in a prophet by the name of Elijah to condemn that thing. After he got old and tired, he was ready to go home. He didn't even have to die. His payoff come also. God just sent him down a chariot and some horses and packed him on up into the heavens. <laughs> Stevens, who stood at the Sanhedrin, spoke out to him and said, Oh, you stiff necks, uncircumcised in the heart and ears, rejecting the policy. You always resist the Holy Ghost like your fathers did. So do you. At his death, he had a payoff. He looked up, saw heavens open. Jesus standing on the right side. Moody. The last days, about a hundred years ago, a little Chicago shoe cobbler could hardly write his name. Paper sent to interview Moody one time. His ministry was so outstanding, they wanted to see him put the paper. What, made it, what was about Moody? What kind of a preacher? He must be in a dynamic preacher. So they sent for an interview to write their editorial. Moody couldn't even read it after they wrote it. So... His manager had to read it for him. And he said, here's the way the editorial read. He said, why anybody would go to hear Dwight Moody preach is more than I can say. He said, the first thing, he's the ugliest man i ever seen. Bald-headed and whiskers hanging down. And said he's as, he's as big around as he is tall. And said, when he tries to preach, he can't read and he whines when he preaches. Talks through his nose and lisps. And when he got through, Mr. Moody just shrugged his shoulders and said, Sure not, they come to see Christ. <laughs> well, that was it. Amen. No matter what the critics was, Amen. he held a policy. Amen. And when he was dying, the doctor said, That's death that struck Mr. Moody. He raised up, he said, You call this death? This is my carnation day. <laughs> he held the policy. My good friend, Paul Rader, when I was a little boy, I was, a, I was ordained to Missionary Baptist Church, and Paul Rader was a Missionary Baptist also. So Fort Wayne, when he used to go here, he preached later, got over here on the West Coast and got so much trouble and finance trouble till he got sick, finally led to cancer, and he was dying. Him and Luke had went together all their life, stuck together like my son and I. So when Paul was dying, the Moody Bible Institute sent out a quartet, and they were standing there. Paul had a sense of humor. He was, the little mighty, little Moody Bible Institute with this choir had sent down there, or a quartet, and they were singing, Near my God to thee. Paul turned over and threw the sheet off of him and said, Who's dying near you? <laughs> huh? He said, Raise up them shades and sing me some good snappy gospel songs. And they begin to sing, Down at the cross where my Savior died, Down there for cleansing from sin I cried, There to my heart was the blood applied, Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Paul said, Where's my brother Luke? Luke was in the next room. He didn't want to see his brother die. He said, Tell him to come here. So Luke walked in. Many of you knew him. Big, heavy-set fella. He walked in. Paul reached out his hand, laying on the bed, and tucked Luke by the hand, looked up in his face, said, Luke, we've come a long ways together. But think of it, Luke, in five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Hallelujah. Holding his brother's hands, his policy paid off. Old Dr. Bosworth, that was here the last time with me, next to the last time, 84 years old, just returning from Africa. I had a call to come to Miami. I tore the tires off my car and really get there. Say he was dying. I rushed to him. I know he's a policyholder. I went down. I went in the room there. The little bald-headed fellow with his arms up, his little skinny arms. 
I run to him and fell on my face and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He put his hands up on me and blessed me. I said, Brother Bosworth, can I pray for you? And no. And I'm not sick. I said, What's the matter, Brother Bosworth? I said, I'm just going home. I said, I knew that. And I said, I want to ask you something, Brother Bosworth. I said, when was the greatest time of your life, your ministry? You've been serving God before I was born. We've been on the mission fields together. We've been in storms in the air and on the sea. You stood by me when I seen devils on every side and witch doctors. And there's great thrills when we've seen God paralyze and standing there. What was the greatest thrill of your life? He said, right now. He's fixed the cash in his policy. Hallelujah. He said, all I've lived for, Brother Brenham, has been Jesus Christ. And any minute, he'll walk in the door to take me home. Yes, those were policy holders that give everything they had and invested it in the pearl of great price. Won't you invest tonight, too, while we bow our heads? I cannot see across the audience. I do not know what's, how many or who's looking in, in the closed-circuit television tonight. I'm going to ask you, friend, let that just be idle words. You're mortal. You must die. You know it. And it may be before morning your time will come. I'm not a person, not much on persuading and because Jesus said, all the Father has given me will come. If there's a room in the heart for that policy tonight, I want you to accept that that policy is Christ. God's love offer policy for you. His word to become alive in your heart, making you part of him. He is the word. Accept him into your life, won't you do it? And make this great investment. As far as I can see, I can't see it, but about 10 feet from me, 15. I'm going to ask you to raise up your hands. If you'd like to receive one of the eternal life policies, say, I want it, Brother Branham. Just remember me in your prayers. You don't see my hand, but God does. Our Heavenly Father, this simple, rude, yet true story of life, I spoke it this way, Lord, because it people, business people, to understand it more in the way of being something represented here on earth, that's the reason I call it a policy. Forgive me if I was wrong in calling it that. For we are now in a, a real sacred moment where no doubt that there's many thinking seriously now, knowing that they too have to have a payoff on whatever they have here, and they see what it means to turn down. Now that young man, as I know, Perhaps being so popular amongst the people, he remained in church. He kept the commandments. He did not commit adultery or steal or do those things. But in his own heart, he knew that he didn't have eternal life. Make those, Lord, who are trying to meet you for eternal life with just those moral traits, may they tonight receive the invitation and you stay at their feet and say, Lord, I'll do anything that you ask me to do. Grant it, Lord. They're all yours now. I commit everything to you. And if the seed has fallen anywhere, Lord, upon any ground, any predestinated seed for many years has been hungering and thirsting, it might have fell on some somewhere tonight. May they receive life, Father. For I asked it in Jesus Christ's name. With our heads bowed continually, I'm going to ask... Brother Perry, if you will, to come here and remain, take the remaining of the service.